toxic masculine is this old way of being, like I was explaining before, that we have to be aware of. So when you become aware of something, you shine light on it, you're basically going, oh, okay, so through this awareness, which is 50% of the work, now I am able to kind of understand what my programming is and I can slowly deconstruct it. Hey guys, welcome to our Soul Fan podcast where I interview space holders from all over the world. I am your host, my name is Carolina, and I'm the Connection Catalyst. I help spiritual entrepreneurs experience deeper connection with themselves, with others, and with the universe. Today's guest is Kyle Mitri, a men's work facilitator. Welcome to the show, Kyle. How are you doing? Hey, Carolina. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks, love. Thank you so much for showing up. We had some technical difficulties uh, coming our way, but with Mercury retrograde, we know that this is how it goes. And finally, we are on. So I'm super excited to talk to you and uh, yeah, super excited to um, get some beautiful wisdom uh, from you. So I would like to start talking about men in general in present times and how they can open up even more because what I realized with men is that a lot of them are a little bit ashamed of expressing their feelings or putting themselves out there and being more in their feminine vibe and also more in their, let's say, healthy masculine vibe because sometimes I feel like men, you know, because all of these beliefs, men don't cry or things like that, the beliefs that men have stop them from expressing their authentic self and being open to, you know, expressing any emotion that they are going through. And this causes a lot of suffering, I feel, um, at, at least from what I noticed in men around me, my brother, my best friends and how they go about life. And I feel like this is the time now when we're stepping into new earth, we're opening up more and more. But I feel like a lot of men still struggle to open up, to be authentic and to be vulnerable. So what would be your advice to all these men who still, in a way, hide themselves, who still don't express their truth and their authentic self? Okay. So just sinking in to the question and just slowing the, the tempo down. You have to meet men where they're at. So we've just moved into this new earth, which is conscious aware, you know, ability to, you know, create this new space where we're all showing up as best as we can. But you're dealing with a lot of conditioning that men over the last five to 10 years are now sort, starting to sort through, right? So we have the old toxic masculine conditioning, which is, you go forward no matter what the cost, you know, you got to, you know, dominate, you got to fucking succeed, you got to do all of this stuff no matter what the cost, regardless of what is not even heart centered. So that plus we're also taught to, you know, very much be, you know, see our vulnerability as a full on weakness. So the communication, the, the guilt behind our sexual desires, as well as just so much of fear around if we're expressing our vulnerability, we assume that our partners and women in general will see them as a weakness. So what I always say to women, generally speaking, is you need to meet men where they're at right now. It's easy to say, yes, we need men to rise up and da, 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 and all of this stuff, but you've got to give us space in order to do so. And we, we cannot be rushed in this process either. We just want to know that there's a safe container where we can be able to express ourselves and express all of these insecurities and fears that are coming up and know that they're held by the feminine, you know, and know that they're not going to be judged mm. as such. So it's also trust in that, but the container also needs to be held for us as well. So a lot of women in these day and ages are saying, okay, well, you know, men are opening up and they're being much more vulnerable, but they're losing that, you know, that natural mas masculinity sense. And that's where the work is. We've got to fall into this, this feminine energy, which is where we're doing the work, where we, you know, breaking down all of these old toxic pathways and toxic programming that we've been through and now integrating this new way of being, but also doing the work as we're going along, which means sitting in men's work, 
which means, uh, which is the ability to be able to express and communicate and relate with other men for the same things we're going in and, and going on in our lives without projecting all of our insecurities onto our partners. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a two-way street in that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I totally resonate with what you say as men need to feel very safe around women because if women will judge, oh my God, this person is weak because, oh, he's not a man, he's crying or he's not managing life well or whatever, then men will hide and they will not be authentic. They will not be in their power if they are going to be judged. So it's a, again, it's a two-way street also with creating the safety in relationships. And it doesn't have to be partnership. It could be friendships as well to be expressive, to be vulnerable. And I feel like it's not only between men and women, between men and men and women and women as well, because the whole society tells us that it's not okay to cry in the supermarket or it's not okay to express your feelings or to get angry or anything like that. And so I totally resonate with what you said. And I feel like it's so important also as women to know and to feel what where the man is at. Because obviously, you know, some men are further on their development journey. And as you said, getting rid of these patterns, these, this programming um, from childhood mainly and from society generally. But some of them need a little bit of more um, space to do this, to step, step into the power. And I, to I honestly believe that vulnerability and bringing this feminine energy into the masculine within it is even more powerful than focusing only on one part of us that is only feminine or only masculine. I feel like everyone should express both of their sides because this is power. We are both feminine and masculine, divinely dancing within each person. So um, you said something about getting rid of the, the patterns and, you know, breaking breaking them and, and becoming more of who we are. How do you do this with your clients or with yourself? What are your methods of, you know, getting rid of this subconscious programming? So it's, you know, the idea is you first want to identify what you've been taught. And this idea that we got, you know, and I, I use this word Lucy, but toxic masculine is this old way of being, like I was explaining before, that we have to be aware of. So when you become aware of something, you shine light on it, you're basically going, oh, okay, through, through this awareness, which is 50% of the work, now I am able to kind of understand what my programming is and I can slowly deconstruct it and reintroduce new patterns. For me, chivalry, which is a beautiful way to step into a masculine, you know, respectfully, in terms of opening doors, doing these beautiful things in, in order to, you know, gain trust of women in general, which is super powerful. So these ideas of, you know, breaking through these old patterns, but also reintroducing the new patterns of conscious communication, which I would consider more feminine based work, which is this idea of, so what I'll do with clients, but also just friends is I say, if you have a desire or you have an insecurity or anything that's coming up, consistently i want you to voice it i want you to communicate it first and with that comes context which means you've got to create the container first which is consent which is and it looks like this hey um so and so i would love to express something that's coming up a little bit more often now and i'm wondering if we can maybe set some time for that maybe you can hold space for me while i express is that okay so once you've created this container then i'm able to say hey, this is something that's coming up. This is a desire I feel. This is something sensual that I want to express. Or this is a weak, uh, not a, sorry, not a weakness. This is a, a vulnerability that's coming up, a fear and anxiety. Um, and I wanted to express it so I can let go of that energy. And also, you know where I'm at. So you're not guessing as well as I'm not resentful because I'm not keeping it in. And this is the idea. As soon as you start keeping everything in, resentment starts to build towards the other person, but also towards yourself for not being able to express it. So this is the style of work that I'll start to do with the communication side, okay, the feminine, and then with the masculine, reintroducing masculine principles of tradition of breathwork, of what are you doing with men? Are you going and doing any moon rituals? Are you going and doing sun rituals? Are you going and being masculine on the beach? Are you building fires? Are you doing anything with your hands that is creative? 
you know, how are you engaging in that old tribal masculine energy like we used to do back in the tribes, which roots you down, which is so powerful. So I work in with the root and then I work in with kind of all the higher based energies, like the chakras, you would call it, with the vulnerability and the feminine energy here. And basically the idea is to, once you're working on both of them, you're slowly alchemizing them. And that's reintroducing new habitual patterns as the divine masculine, essentially. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It sounds great, uh, the, the work that you do. And so what is for those who listen and they don't really know where to start with working with their tribal and like healthy masculinity and also introducing this feminine energy into their life? What is mm -hmm. a simple exercise or simple maybe meditation that men can do to bring more of this awareness about their masculine and feminine side into their life? That's a great question. So I love application. So it's once you understand something, now how do I apply it consistently through routine and become habitual in my life? So the idea is you want to become subconscious competence, which is when you're doing something over and over and over, then it becomes part of your habitual process. So something for me, um, I'm a huge believer in morning rituals and routines, and I have like a seven or eight stage process of my morning routine. So the first thing is it will be more of something that will be masculine based, which means I like to achieve something first in the morning, which is I make my bed. I make my bed, my place looks clean, and I have achieved it. And it's something so small, but once you've achieved something so small, you have this idea of completion and achievement. And to me, that's a beautiful masculine based way, but also to have your home environment be basically a base of neutrality. So from there, then I'll drink a glass of water. So the first thing that hits my body is something that's soft, something that my body understands. It's mostly water. So there's this natural, again, alchemizing process that's happening. Then I'll go straight into sitting into my meditation. My meditations are anywhere between 10 to 20 minutes. I keep it consistent and sh too short, not to be too long where it's just, it takes me out. And I go through a breathwork process and a breathwork process just brings me into my body. And then I'm just sitting. And from my sitting, I go into my manifestations. I go into my visualizations. I go into mantras. And then from that, I'll work into a bit of body movement. And again, it's working into this idea that I, I need to get my body moving. I need to get it adjusting. And this is back into my kind of more primal base masculine. I need to feel my body. So from there, I'll go into reading. And reading will be a way of me educating myself first thing in the morning. So there's these rituals that I do in the morning, which are both balanced in masculine and feminine. One is primal movement and grounded, as you can see. And the other is a little bit more flowy visual manifestation, mantras, and so on. That's leading me a little bit to, into the kind of ethereum, right? So the idea is I want to be grounded in both. And with that, on a consistent basis, it puts me into... I can see how my day is going. I can visualize it fully. I feel beautiful and confident and aware that I am bringing all this abundance into my life based on what my visualizing is. But at the same time, I can sink into my body. I can move my body. I can drink the water. I can make my bed, which grounds me into ritual. And so you can see how they both balance, both feminine and masculine within myself before eight o'clock even comes in. And only after I finished all my rituals every single morning do I grab my phone and then get into emails, which is a hyper important thing because the stimulation that needs to happen must not be technological in the morning. It must be solely based on my kind of sovereign being, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. I love that. And I love the a way that you do your ritual, how you balance both of the energies. That's beautiful. Uh, I recently had a podcast and uh, the uh, uh, Sarah, the uh, lady I was speaking to, was saying, yeah, I started from five minutes of dancing in the morning and it turned into two hours morning ritual. So it doesn't have to be like you start from the big thing. You can start totally. from something small and then expand and expand. And at some point you have this seven or eight step process that you go through that actually brings you back to your soul because what it is, is actually bringing you back to your center, to your soul and not 
not putting your mind already on the um, rush and and the speed of life and all the work that needs to be done. So that's a beautiful um, advice to everyone who wants to start integrating these feminine and masculine qualities within. So thank you for that. Um, it's amazing. And I also wanted to ask, because I'm super curious, how did you start working with men? Why did you choose men as your uh, target group to work with? Was it because of some life experiences that you've had personally or was it your soul's calling so how how did it start for you so i actually used to work with women primarily um just because i naturally voted well with women i can i could drop into my feminine energy pretty quickly and therefore become really relatable with women and they just felt really safe along the journey working with me and I was working with them first in nutrition and fitness, and then it became kind of life coaching. Then it became kind of trauma work. So it was this trauma healing and I actually created a beautiful uh, retreat company with a friend of mine, Tanya, called Vibrant Living Retreats, uh, which is now kind of ended. Um, and that was amazing work that we did with these women who would come and have these great awakenings super quickly. And then realizing how quick we were, you know, getting these women to awaken and move into their power, we had to also aware, be aware that we had to move into integration just as quickly, which is how to integrate all of these principles back into this three-dimensional reality and not have everyone divorce their husbands when they went home. So a lot of this work, <laughs> which is powerful because this is exactly what happens after you have awakenings. You have these crazy realizations, but before you integrate, you want to make decision, decision, decision. And anyone who's, you know, will do medicine as well will know that you need, you know, a week to just decompress and then, in, you know, at least a couple of other weeks to integrate, you know, what you've learned through your process. So this is something that became pretty aware to us very quickly. So after that happened and the retreat company kind of, you know, faded out, I, I was always doing a lot of work on myself, always, you know, challenging myself consistently to what my beliefs are, to what they're not, to delabeling every single thing I think I know about relationships, about people, about sexuality and what my sexuality is and what I like. And through all of this work started coming this uh, awareness for myself of like, okay, shit, like I, I'm going through this, I'm processing this and now I'm, you know, kind of alchemizing this process. So once I reached that point of kind of alchemization, which is this awareness that I've fully integrated what I've learned into this current existence, now I can start to facilitate. And so this idea came, I, I you know, was naturally just helping men move through conscious communication, this um, self-awareness, sexuality, mother, father wounds, that we're dealing with this, this idea of, you know, how do I integrate my, my feminine and masculine energy safely towards myself, my partnerships, as well as those around me, which is super powerful. So through that work, I just started picking up, you know, clients. And then I started just doing a little bit more facilitation through men's work. And I realized how much I like it and how much it's part of my dharma, my life's calling. And it's been really beautiful ever since. And, um, you know, through the other businesses I've created, I've been slowly kind of nurturing and building this side of myself even more. And really grateful to be in a position where I can actually, you know, help, you know, guide other men through the processes that I've gone through. Mm, beautiful. That's amazing. So where men can find you, uh, just to those who listen and would like to work with you and discover more of their manhood and femininity, how they can find you? Um, so the best way is going to be through my Instagram, which is kyle.mitri, M-I-T-R-I. And yeah, I've got a little Calendly link up there. You can just check. It's, you know, I, I like to do word of mouth. So generally a lot of my clients just hear about me through friends and friends of friends. So, but yeah, please feel free to reach out uh, in whatever capacity. Thanks for sharing. Amazing. And so you mentioned that you do trauma work uh, with your clients as well. What is your method of working with traumas? Because as you know, I do uh, similar things as well uh, using the completion process, which is a inner child healing method, trauma release, uh, as you can say. So I'm really curious to hear about your method. Like how, how does it work? What is the process and what is the outcome as well? So you know, when I started working with women in this capacity, it, it started being this, this idea of creating safe space within other women 
to be able to hold this container while people could open up about their full fears and trauma in a beautiful, safe space. And once they felt safe to open up about this trauma, that was almost like 50% of the work that was done. So it's this idea of being in a space in a circle, especially having a man there where a lot of this trauma has come from from women is from other men, whether it's physical, mm -hmm. verbal, mental abuse. So to have a man there who could provide male perspective but also hold space was very powerful. And that's something I realized. And generally, women would just open up with other women. They would never open up with a man about what a man has done. So the idea is, from my perspective, is that I was holding that space for the masculine to apologize and to provide safety for mm. women in order to express. So that was a huge part of this idea of what re holding space as a, as a masculine really looks like. And then through that process, we would take them through, obviously, the inner child work of, you know, going back to that inner child where that trauma happened, taking them through the trauma with absolute love and compassion and realizing that the best they could have done at that point in time with what was happening and it was not their fault. And what was happening to them was not their fault. And it was not, mm -hmm. you know, this conditioning based around that. And through that, there would be this unletting and offloading and unpacking in the safe capacity. Mm -hmm. And through that, once they were starting to offload this trauma, they started to just feel so much lighter and essentially start rising in their awakening process really quickly. But again, it's the consistency of the work that we were doing, of the unpacking, of the you know coming to terms and alchemizing the process of the trauma, and then moving forward really slowly while also having the support system within that. So what we would do with the, with a woman essentially was they would all be supporting each other. So we would take as the facilitators out, ourselves outside because we didn't want to have this kind of hierarchy of healing. So we made it as mm -hmm. a collective group healing. So they were there in support. They were there in rhetorician. They were there in holding space for one another. But the idea is that they would do this as sovereign beings, but within a support system. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes, so, and became absolutely. And super powerful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it it sounds very powerful, and I'm with you on this idea that there is no external healers outside of us. Really, a healer is someone who can guide you through the process of healing, and you are the one doing the healing anyway. So I get you completely when you talk about the hierarchy of healing, because some people come, you know, to me or to other coaches or healers, and with this kind of idea oh, come and heal me, you know, do something about me. <laughs> I'm here, mm -hmm. the victim of my circumstances, and you totally. you can heal me, so help me. But that doesn't work that way. Everyone is their own healer. And if we can just, as you said, hold space and help people access these feelings and help people release them and let them out of the body, then people can see that they are their own master of their life, the creator and the healer as well. So, and as in the group settings, it's even more powerful, I found, because the more people you have and the more people can focus their love, their energy into this one person that is going through the traumatic event, the easier it all flows and the easier for someone to also let it out of their body, I found. So that's really interesting. Um, I'm doing very similar process with the trauma work that I do, which is when you focus on the feeling and you also go back to the original childhood trauma, this very first time that this emotion that you feel right now has happened in childhood up to the age maybe seven or 10 years old. And then it's pretty interesting because I see this inner child part of us as more feminine part in a way because it's full of emotions. It's full of this emotional charge that it needs to express. And once that's expressed, we come into the memory in the completion process in the method that I'm using as an adult and we uh -huh. are reparenting this inner child, but also bringing this more logical perspective into the memory. So saying, for example, that it's not your fault, as you said, and bringing this more understanding mental perspective in a way that is more linked to the uh, left hemisphere of our brain that is more masculine, right? So it's kind of like balancing uh -huh. the feminine part, the emotional part and the mental part together, balancing the hemispheres yeah. of the brain in a way. And then the outcome can be that we really reparent our inner child, we meet the needs, we do other steps of the process that help us really let go of the trauma and close it behind, which is, again, mm -hmm. harmonizing the feminine and masculine part, uh, which is pretty interesting mm -hmm. that that's how it's all inter interconnected within. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty cool. 
<laughs> it's powerful. You know, there's been, there's many ways and, and something I've seen in terms of just trauma work and, and, and unpacking that, like you were saying, it's, it's the idea you want to alchemize the inner child with your current being. And how do we do that? How do you mesh them together while throwing so much compassion into the inner child with, which is throwing away the guilt and saying you did the best you could with what you had and actually taking mm. this version of yourself and hugging that version of yourself as a child where the trauma happened. And that's where this alchemizing process comes in. And that's why visualization in that capacity is so powerful consistently. And it's something I do with my inner child constantly. I still come to tears when I think of the pain I went through as a child, but I have so much love and compassion. I just give this little Kyle like a big hug and I say, brother, you are amazing. You're incredible. You did the best you could with what you had. I'm so proud of you. And then there's this mirroring mm. and optimization process, which is such a beautiful thing. And, you mm. know, just for those out there, when, when your trauma is too heavy, and to go back into it is too triggering. There's also ways and submodality work where you can do this and run yourself through a process that we call like it's a double distraction. So you almost put yourself, just a quick explanation, you put yourself in the cinema and in the cinema, you're sitting in the center of the cinema controlling the movie projector, which is kind of showing over the movie that's in front of you the trauma that's happened. So you like double disconnected from what's happening where you can play this trauma through the movie, but you in control of what's being shown and you're sitting in the cinema watching it. So you're two parts mm -hmm. disconnected while you're going through this trauma. And then that's also a way to, you know, basically go from where the trauma is, give yourself love and compassion, and then fast forward to where you are now. And then rewind, mm -hmm. love and compassion, fast forward to where you are now. It's like this alchemizing process while being double disconnected from, you know, your actual trauma process, which is fascinating and it works extremely well. Um, so yeah, that's just another little piece of piece of information. That's amazing. And so when you do this work, when you, in a way, dissociate from the experience and you give yourself love and compassion and rewind, do you afterwards also associate with the experience when you are ready to handle it? Or is it just that you're kind of like getting more distance from it and this is how you heal? Well, well, the, the, the distance from it originally, when, when I say you're like, you know, two parts disconnected from the trauma is when going into the trauma or the fear or the phobia is just too much. So it's too much mm -hmm. and it triggers you too much. So the idea is, you know, being two parts disconnected as you're going through the trauma until you feel more comfortable and then going back to the thought of the trauma isn't as heavy. And then what I'll do is just mm -hmm. maybe do one part disconnected and then I'll do no parts disconnected and I'll take you through the trauma process. And then if you're not as triggered, because remember, the more you go into it and the more you kind of are aware of it and is the more you letting go. Think of it as like a weighted vest. Mm -hmm. The more I'm aware of it and pouring love and compassion, the more it's just going to fall off like butter. So then I can access it and have so much love and compassion towards it without being as triggered. And therefore, without being as triggered, that's not going to be I'm not going to be doing using that as my program set forward right now. You know, the less, the more you deal with it and the more you unpack it, the less it's going to affect your current version of yourself because we make mm -hmm. decisions and everything we do is based on the trauma that we went through, which leads us to the people we are, you know, good and bad. So the idea is as we unpack more and more and more and more and become more awareness of it, we're giving it less ability to affect us in this current version of ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I sometimes compare it to the glasses that you suddenly just take off and you're like, oh my God, life was actually completely different than what I thought. Because now you don't have totally. this filter telling you, for example, I don't know, rich people are bad or women are yeah. all like this or, you know, and then you suddenly realize, oh my God, it's just not as I thought for my whole life. <laughs> and only exactly. now I realize it. Yeah, which is pretty interesting when, when you do this work. <laughs> you know, I have, um, I, I sat in, in one uh, yoga session uh, with a very powerful yoga teacher once, and he described the, the healing process very interesting. So here you have your soul, right? You're the clear version of who you are, who Carolina is 100% with no programs, nothing. Here is the lens 
in which your soul shines through in order to come to here, which is, let's just say, the planet, the 3D version of yourself that has appeared on this planet. So the, the idea is to try to get your soul as clearly shining through that lens as possible to shine onto the earth as clean and clear as possible as the best version of yourself. But in this human experience, our lens gets dirtied through our programming and it gets dirtied through, you know, trauma, generational, ancestral, you know, trauma, all this kind of stuff. So it's our job in this version of ourselves in this human body to be clearing and cleaning this lens as, as much as possible through the work we're doing, cutting the ties, the generational ties, all of this stuff. So our soul can shine through as clear as possible. And it was such a beautiful metaphor to understand where the work is being done. And every time we go through a healing, that lens gets cleared and it gets more cleared and more cleared and more cleared, you know, which is a consistent process, but it's, it's amazing how much more you feel like yourself when you're doing the healing. And this is something that came very profoundly to me. It is crazy. Literally, I always say to everyone, since I've started doing shadow work, trauma work, emotional release, my life has completely changed in all areas of my life with no exception. Just everything in my life got better. And it's only been over two years for me to do very, very deep work. And before that, I've also worked on myself, but not with shadow work, with other methods like meditation and um, reprogramming my ne neural pathways through chakra meditation, for example. But since I started doing shadow work, I'm just like, oh my God, everything changes. And it can change really rapidly because if you take off this filter of very heavy trauma that was affecting your life, for so many years, then with this new perspective, you can start a new business. You can completely differently communicate to people. You can attract different people to your life that will bring you more fulfillment and you're going to attract different um, relationships because then you don't have this trauma dictating mm. who you attract, right? Through law of attraction. So I'm with you yeah. on how big it is. <laughs> It's just so powerful. You just, you, you're so much, I mean, you know, from my perspective and experience is uh, the amount of work I've done. And when you start the work, you realize it's a never ending scenario, which is beautiful. But what you, what I've realized is I feel so much more myself most of the time mm -hmm. based on the work I've done, which means mm -hmm. I'm allowed to shine fully with no guilt consistently based on the work that I've done. And there's, there's mm -hmm. no amount of money that could pay for that, you know? Absolutely. And that just reminded me of this, how we talk about completion process, the, the method that I do as the practice of putting yourself back together again. So that's exactly what you said. It's kind of like a piece of jigsaw puzzle coming to the wholeness. And now you're here and you're gathering all these subconscious parts of you that were stuck in the trauma, replaying this trauma on the back of your subconscious mind over and over again. You're bringing them back to yourselves and completing um, completing the, the jigsaw <laughs> in a way with yeah. all these parts of you. And also I felt like um, I feel like sharing this metaphor that Tilson, the creator of this method, uh, says that our consciousness is like water. And when we have a trauma, part of this water or of this big river is kind of like going sideways and just getting stuck there. And the water, the, you, the more traumas you have, the less and less energy you have because the river gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then you don't have as much life force to utilize in your life because some of this life force is stuck there in a way in the trauma. So the more you regain this consciousness, this, these parts of you back to yourself and reparent your inner child and release these emotions, the more energy you have generally um, as the life force in your body. So that's what I'm finding uh, after doing the shadow work every time that I feel more energized, more powerful. It's mm. like there is more of me in a way. <laughs> Yeah, a hundred percent. Awesome. So I have one um, little question to you based on my life mm -hmm. that I feel like could help others as well. Cause you mentioned the topic of sexuality and how you help men being more authentic and express themselves uh, in their sexuality. And I found that 
for a lot of people, it's actually very shameful to express what they like sexually or what they feel. And I wanted to ask you if you have any tips for people who are still maybe afraid of the judgment from this other side, from someone that they would express to, or they're still ashamed of saying what they like. Because for me, for example, let's say four years ago, I couldn't say to my partner what I like in bed. I was completely ashamed of it. I didn't even know how to start and what to say and how to communicate in a way that I'm not going to make him feel like he's not enough and he's not performing. And, you know, I was just worried about how I'm going to be received. So my question was, how do these people who still struggle to express themselves in bed about their sexuality how can they overcome their shame and fear of judgment because i found that for me let's say four years ago i struggled to express myself and to say exactly what i want and what i need in bed because i was afraid that maybe a man would feel not good enough or you know it will feel like pressure for him to perform and so what would be your advice to overcome shame for men and women for the sake in their sexual life. So let's start with some like little general t statistics, right? So the idea around this is this, this heavy programming of the pressure to perform, which is massive with men, right? So, you know, another statistic is, is this, I think it's like 70 or 80% of people don't know what their partner likes in bed. I think it's even higher, to be honest, in my experience, because wow. of this fear and guilt around that, right? So a lot of what's happening with younger males today, and I'm talking when the internet age came in, so let's say 35 and lower, right? Is they have performance-based erectile dysfunction, right? Or porn-induced erectile dysfunction as well, same thing. And the idea behind this is they've had so much pressure through porn of the amount of women that they, you know, have during a sitting of masturbating and all of the stuff that's happening has now created so much stimulation that when they're only with one woman, it's not enough stimulation. So basically they have a fear of performance. They don't get hard. And then that creates a whole stream and situation. So this is just an understanding behind the pressure that comes with, you know, with men in terms of performance. So it's a little bit of a, a long way around it, but the idea behind this is, and the solution is communication. And communication means to express the vulnerability, to express the desires and to uh, express the fears that are coming up when you're in bed with another partner. So it's all about this, this pressure of performance of, from a man's perspective is I've got to come, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, you know, later in the session, I've got to make sure my woman comes way before I do. I've got to make sure I am basically performing like an absolute porn star, you know, and then only then am I enough. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't even take into account my pleasure because it's not about that. It's about your pleasure and making you come 150 times because then I feel like a man. So if I come early or something like that happens, guess what? I'm going to feel like I'm not a man because I've attached my masculinity to this performance anxiety that comes with, you know, having sex, making love, multiple partners, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. So the idea moving forward with anything that comes from guilt and resentment within the bedroom and the pressure to perform is ask what your partner likes. Ask what your partner doesn't like have the conversations around it. Yes, it's fun to get to know what your partner likes without, you know, verbalizing it, but it's even better when you can talk about it. So mm. once you go through a session with your partner, hey baby, what did you like? What didn't you like? What would you like to try? What really turns you on? Oh, well, you know, when I came a little bit quicker the, the other time, it made me feel kind of insecure because I feel like I have a lot of pressure to perform all the time. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Okay, now I'm here, I'm able to express this. And through that expression, I can let go of all of this kind of pressure and judgment. And then you also are aware of where I am. And the more you as a feminine are aware of where I'm at, you feel safer. 
Mm. Because if I'm able to express my desires, if I'm able to express my fears and anxieties as well, you feel safe because you know what's coming out of me is true. And I'm not holding on to it and therefore causing resentment and judgment of myself because you can pick that up. So mm. that's expression. That's conversation. It's so powerful. And even in the spiritual community, they don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the ability of understanding your own sexuality and your own desires. So that's why I'm in such a believer of um, open relating and, and freedom of sexuality. It's so powerful. But when done in the context of open and conscious communication. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And safety and trust and unconditional love as well. Because if, you know, if you feel like you're going to be judged you know, for what you express, then surely you're not going to express all of your desires, but there is a way to express it and to say no to someone expressing their desires towards us, for example, that doesn't hurt them, doesn't hurt their feelings. You can say, thank you. I'm yeah. so honored that you express this desire to me right now. It's not in alignment with me, but mm -hmm. you know, my, I, I wish you the best luck of of meeting this need somewhere else or meeting this desire somewhere else. And, and I love you okay. and <laughs> I honor you and your desires. So, you know, it's communication is everything, but for people, sometimes it's quite challenging to express themselves authentically because they are too shy or maybe too scared. And as if someone is going to take courage, you know, to take the step and say it openly, then only they will realize, oh my God, it wasn't that bad. I actually have nothing to be ashamed of. And every, everyone has emotions. Everyone has some fears. So if you can step up, express it, and just put it out there, then it's definitely going to make your relationship um, with your partner or with other people way better. And it's going to build more trust and safety, as we said. And so you 100%. mentioned that a lot of people or men have the, the erectile dysfunction porn induced um, and so how would you deal with that did have you had any clients who have had this problem or maybe who were addicted to porn and if yes then how did you deal with that what what did you tell them to do and to get out of it because i feel like there's a lot of men so, that are actually addicted to porn nowadays mm, but not everyone talks well, about sure. it <laughs> so so it's pretty easy i i had this but it wasn't porn induced um, so I opened up a relationship, um, I think two, two partners back and I discovered my sexuality, how much I love being with women, how much I just honor women so much. And I just exploded in this ability to, you know, want to be with multiple women and then come back to my partner. And this was because we were doing it and I was unaware of how to process this whole thing it kind of hurt my inner values, my core values, because I was having sex with other women. And then, you know, that day coming back to my partner and I didn't realize how much it was actually affecting me because I wasn't creating clear boundaries and, and a healthy container for what we were in our sex life because I was just mixing too many energies. Mm -hmm. And then what ended up happening is when I would go home with a woman at night, you know, off like a, like a one nighter, you know, which has, you know, zero real sensuality or connection, it's just an ability to have sex with someone. I wasn't getting hard. And then this was happening more frequently. And I was just like, well, wait a minute. What's, what's happening right now? Are you kidding me? And like my, all of my masculinity is attached to my ability to have sex, you know, mm -hmm. and perform. So now there was this big, oh my God, I'm not even getting hard. I, I can't even perform. What the fuck is going on? So that was a huge swipe to my sensuality, my sexuality, my masculinity, everything so what ended up happening was i realized this and i was going through a lot of my own internal process of about a year and a half where this was a realization for me of something that i needed to fix repair and become aware of so what i did was i became celibate for about three months where i was like i got to take myself just off the market because i you know i can't be going into this because i feel so bad when it doesn't happen and then it just knocks me back 10 10 steps so I may as well just not even do it. So what that did was provide me the ability to build sensual connections with women and hold space with women without a sexual prowess, without a sexual desire, without an end goal, mm -hmm. which is something I tell men a lot of, which is not to always think of this end goal of trying to have sex. 
you know, be present with the woman you're in. And if it moves into, you know, beautiful sexual relations, that's incredible. But build the sensuality first, which means I got to feel safe and I got to connect with my partners in order for me to be in a container of safety. And then my body will respond as such. Mm -hmm. And once I feel safe, then I'll, I'll feel like, oh, okay, I can relax. My body will now do what it needs to do, get hard, feel good, feel stimulated because I slowed everything down. So that's something I recommend to a lot of men. Stop watching porn. Eat cleaner. Stop jerking off because you want to build your chi. You want to build your energy, your fluids, your jing. Once you go from that process and you stop kind of like deconstructing all that old toxic behavior, start connecting with women. And celibacy is also powerful. So not having sex is powerful. Building sensuality with women. You know, cuddle puddles, massages, sensuality, nothing sexual at first. Build this trust with yourself, with the opposite sex or with the same sex. Then from that modus operandi, what you can start to do is feel safer in these environments. And then they will naturally start to progress into a little bit more sensuality and therefore a little bit more sexuality as it progresses. But on your own terms, without this pressure of trying to perform or trying to have an end goal. So I went through a lot of this and I processed a lot. I alchemized a lot, which is why I'm in a beautiful space to be able to talk about this very openly. And I understand the pain that comes from this. And it is such a, a fear for men because it directly attacks their masculinity when they can't perform. Mm -hmm. You know, this is kind of, you know, biologically what makes us a man is that we can get hard and reproduce. You know what I mean? So when mm -hmm. you can't, you can imagine what that does to your sense of self-esteem and your confidence. It destroys you. So from that vantage point and that awareness, you can start to rebuild the layers of what it means to be, you know, a divinely masculine man. With her. So it was a blessing and a curse at the same time. But obviously for me, mostly a blessing because of what it taught me. Absolutely. And I just wanted to mention, as you were saying, that maybe it is a way that your self-esteem decreases and you feel like shit and you feel like not like a man. But honestly, it helps you look at yourself. Who are you without mm -hmm. this performance? Who are you without, you know, having these sexual encounters with women? Who are you beyond your mm -hmm. physical body and your earthly desires and i feel like that could really be an awakening process for someone yeah. to go through that and i feel like as well as you said celibacy to just let go of it for a moment yeah. and see who you are without attachments to these things and i feel like it could be with anything really it's the same with fasting if you don't eat for some time you can really discover who you are without reaching out for you know, something sweet or uh, something good to taste yeah. every once in a while, then what is left within Listen who you it. are? So, so, yeah, it's beautiful. Thank mm. you for sharing that. Thank you for being so vulnerable and open. I feel like it can help a lot of men to also open up and share their mm. authentic truth. And for today, we're going to have to um, close it off. But I'm super grateful that you came mm. on the podcast Uh, thank you so much, Kyle. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And I really hope that I will chat to you at some point in the future because we have more topics to talk about. I'm still, you know, my curiosity is still um, awakened <laughs> mm -hmm. to talk to you. But thank, thank you, you. Thank you. It's thank you pleasure. so much for today. And I hope yes, to see you again. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. Ciao. Namaste. Thank you, beautiful souls, for being with us today. I absolutely loved the conversation with Kyle, and I hope that you loved it as well. And I hope to see you next time. Sending you much love, positivity, and good vibes.